All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, been uh, given that I'm one of the coordinators, I get to get bounced around a lot on the schedule. So here we go. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the things we've been looking at over the last few years in terms of exploring longitudinal evolution of our star. And of course, we do a lot of latitudinal exploration, but not a whole lot of longitudinal exploration. In fact, back in the day, back in the 70s and 80s, um, a lot of people spent a lot of time, probably to do with the fact that we had much less data at the time, exploring longitudinal behavior and things like uh, active longitudes and active region nests and things were very prevalent in the literature, or at least more prevalent in the literature than they are now. And of course, unfortunately, because Alan Tyrell couldn't make it, um, I was expecting him to go off on a very lengthy statistical um, discussion about clustering of flares and CMEs and active regions that are all intrinsically tied to lo longitudinal behavior. So in, in that vein, I'm going to open up with this plot on the left and attempt to explain it, even though the resolution of my laptop is not synced well with the projector at all. The premise here is that, you know, shown on this plot up here, not that one, you can see that there's clusters of reds and blue dots, and there's actually green dots in this little plot. And this is the distribution of flares of C class and above. Green's, green C, M is blue, and red is X, only for the last solar cycle, right? Only for the present solar cycle. And what you notice is if you look at the daily sunspot number, you take a running, uh, 50 day running average over it, you see that the sunspot number, thank you, is very, um, there you go, yeah. looks periodic. It's not an artifact of the smoothing window, it is the fact that there are surges of sunspots, surges of active regions. In fact, the sunspot, the solar cycle type variability, and this thing are almost of equal order of magnitude. So there's something that's driving the appearance of flux, right? It's not just random. And what's more than that, if you look at the occurrence of M and X class flares, those M and X class flares almost always coincide with surges of flux emergence. Now, as someone who in his fledgling days wrote a lot of sand pile model papers, playing with avalanches and things, this isn't sand pile model. Look at flares. Look at CMEs. This is something that's a force system. This is not just a simple build up of stress in the corona that falls, falls, causes a collapse over a course of you know, weeks, months. This is something that happens very instantaneously. So, you know, while I can't channel Alan, I can at least point this out. And one of the reasons why we've been looking at this is that we think that, I'm speculating, that the reason that you have these large episodic bursts of flux emergence is to do with rotation. It's a rotational instability on the flux tubes that give rise to sunspots, right? It's a longitudinal phenomenon. Think of the jet stream and the Gulf Stream in our atmosphere. Those are long longitudinal phenomena, but in a very thin atmosphere. Think about something like that taking place in a magnetized deep atmosphere, and you get somewhere close to the picture. Now, stepping back a little bit, when you start to stitch together these beautifully unique four years of observations from SDO and AIA, here in this uh, one I'm showing is 304, you start to see marches of things right, marches of things left. You see polar holes, the eye of Sauron here on the south pole, and you see filaments, uh, some of the spirals that were mentioned yesterday. So characterizing data like this is of of critical, critical importance to understanding what the heck is going on with our star and what's driving space weather. It's not just random stuff, okay? How do we know? 
can we take a meteorological type approach to this data? Because the big advance in terrestrial meteorology was what? When you're able to sample the whole system. If it was only reliant on your one local horizon, skill and predictability was close to zero. It was like four or five hours. Now, with the ability to observe the whole system, you can push that up to days, weeks, except if you're in Colorado, where it's like minutes. But anyway. You know, if I take, if I step up in the atmosphere, and I've got to give um, credit to Paulette and her crew for helping stitch, having uh, stitched some of these together, which I raided from our website. You know, in the coronal emission, you absolutely start to see the, the effect that Dean was talking about yesterday. So this crown, this polar crown effect, and how it occludes polar coronal holes. But in this situation, in these movies, you get to have a look somewhat at the reduced scale of the polar coronal hole. You get to see active region formation. And there's also a bizarre phenomena that happens that all of a sudden, at a point in the solar cycle, if I think I've got the slides in the right order, where you go from maybe having one longitude that has an active region on it, and guess what? Within one rotation or two, you have five or six active longitudes. And it stays that way and just gets progressively stronger as the cycle goes on. We'll get to that in a sec. So, since I've everything looks like a hammer, or everything looks like a nail and I have a hammer, I'm going to apply it. So, I capture these little EUV bright point things on the disk, right? They're a few megameters across, but they seem to be ubiquitous across the cycle. And I guess a lot of the old literature said that they were also uniform on the disk. Well, that's not true at all. Not true. And so if you can stitch together the data from the three spacecraft, you're trying to get to get a look at how these small scale magnetic structures evolve. These magnetic structures have an approximate um, separation of about 100 megameters or so. And you get movies like this. So if you take that last movie and stitch it together and take a running 28 day average, you get polar projections that look like this. Does anybody see anything categorically different about the polar region? The bright point density, now the old picture of EUV bright points was that they form at every supergranular vertex, or most. That's bollocks, to use a very accurate Scottish term. Nonsense. There is something very different about convection at the high latitudes. Okay? So again, you get to see this idea of marching armies. You get to also get a glimpse, you know, this thing's running pretty quickly. How long an active region lives? Do we even have an idea of how long active regions live? Has anyone taken the time to stitch together data of a long enough time span to get accurate profiles of how long an active region lives? How many flares does it give off in its lifetime? What's its flux distribution? I know Carl has um, average profiles that he showed in this previous talk. That's really important. But we've never really done a systematic survey of longitudinal evolution. Maybe we should. Why? Okay? Polar regions. Seems like 55 degrees is about, about approximately a barrier. What's going on with convection at high latitudes? Now, you can play another toy, and this won't project well, so I'm not going to keep leave up for very long. Top movie is 12 seconds worth. It's an image analysis every 12 seconds. In the bottom, it's a minute, and I should have put the one that's a day. But the idea here is that, like we saw yesterday, we can start to characterize at least the appearance of these structures at high latitudes, because there's no foreshortening effect. There's a lot of things we can do at high latitudes right now that are maybe pinpointing problems. You know, uh, I'm not going to leave that up because it's not projecting well at all. But in terms of longitudinal evolution, so we'll go back to our bright point density map. And now what we're looking at here is longitude around in a circle. And time's evolving, and you're going to see how the sun rapidly evolves from one active region to six. It goes from m equals one to m equals six in two months. And it never comes back. In fact, it takes six years for it to come back. Right? So it goes from having almost no activity to having almost all longitudes 
And this is in less than a year. And it stays like that for a long time. How the hell does that work? Right? You'll see that those patches of flux stay in approximately the same longitudes. In fact, they drift. If I play this movie at 100 frames a second, you can see them drifting. They drift with speeds of about 3 meters per second. The way to characterize that is by using plots like this. This is a Hofmuller diagram, so this is a standard meteorological diagnostic. Once you have sampled the entire system, it is longitude as a function of time at fixed latitudes. And so all this movie is doing is scanning across different latitudes in my data cube. Right? And so does everybody see as it loops back and forth how the structures are changing their orientation? Some are leaning right, some are leaning left. They're giving you hints at phase speeds and group speeds in the system. They go through zero. Is it also, is it mapping out differential rotation? Well, I, I'm, what I'm going to bet with you is, if I had a full cycle's worth of this, what I'm actually mapping out is a torsional oscillation. The deviation from the rotation profile that you would expect is a torsional oscillation. So it's a magnetized phenomenon. Okay, no big shock. But when you look at these things, so this is just a northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere Hofmuller diagram, you can start to play games with these blobs. And what we see is that the blobs, at least for this sample, appear to occur predominantly in lifetimes of integer numbers of rotations. Right? There's a lot at 28 days, there's 56 days, uh, 92, etc. There are also characteristic longitudes in the data. So there's something that's driving these patterns of flux emergence, and it looks like rotation. Why else would it have rotational characteristics to it? It should be random. What about chrono holes? We heard a little bit about chrono holes yesterday. So yet again, another uh, beautiful movie stitched together from stereo and SDO. Not enough people are looking at this data. You do the same thing. You build the Hofmuller diagrams for the corona. And you look at the latitudinal dependence. So now what you're trying to do is identify these blobs, these dark patches, these coronal holes. How do they vary as a function of latitude? One of the prevailing theories about coronal holes, of course, is they're to do with active region diffusion. Do we know how many, what percentage of coronal holes are to do with active region diffusion? Is it 100%? Is it 50%? With a data set like this, you can unambiguously tell. Okay? Turns out, it's not 100%. It's probably somewhere about 60%. And in fact, if you look at rotation, those rotational lifetimes of coronal holes, it's plotted up here, you see that the bulk have lifetimes of the order of one rotation. But there are substantial population that have lifetimes in the hundreds of days. And funnily enough, at least for this four years of data, those live at mid-latitudes. Not the active region band latitudes, but mid-latitudes. So somewhere about 40 to 50 degrees. Those guys live a long time. And what I would argue is, chances are, those are to do with the activity bands of the upcoming solar cycle. Somebody plotted something about AA index yesterday. I can't remember who it was. But I think it's a telltale. Also, if you look at their velocity characteristics, you see that these long-lived chrono holes want to have apparent motions of about 55 meters per second. They're not variable. The guys, the short-lived ones, have a broad spectrum of velocities. Not the long-lived ones. So if you make a butterfly diagram, but of course, again, remember, it's only four years of data. Someone has to, where's Chris? Where's Louder? Hey, Chris. Someone needs to do this for 22 years. OK, just, just heads up. Is this band my equi ex exhibiting equator migration, or is it just my eyes preferentially seeing it? Of course, we're too early in the southern hemisphere to see equatorward migration. But I bet if you continue this on, you'd start to see it later, because there was a two-year phase lag between the hemispheres. So 
jumping. More longitudinal, latitudinal evolution. Does everybody know about polar crown filaments? Why does the sun have a polar crown filament at all? Why does it seem to be preferentially biased to one more, towards one latitude in each hemisphere? Of the order of 55 degrees again. Before it migrates off. This is 140 years of data. This is no fluke. Okay? There's a pattern, a structure in this data that repeats and repeats and repeats. 55 degrees or there or thereabouts with a uh, RMS, a deviation of a few degrees, seems to be a recurrent preferred latitude. It's also the latitude at which the polar coronal hole is bounded, right? There is something going on with convection at high latitudes. In fact, I would argue it's convection and circulation. Because I have to separate the two, whether that's right or wrong, mathematically, I don't know. So there's something wacky going on. If you put it in context of the butterfly diagram, you can join all the dots you want. But there's two things you've got to notice. Actually, you can't see it in this plot. But the butterfly wings, the things that start at mid-latitudes and before they start migrating to the equator, and the initial motion of the polar crown filament to the poles are synchronized. Something is synchronizing them. What is it? Not just once, but for 14 cycles. It's no fluke. Something's happening. Not going to put that up. What is it? You can do another standard uh, technique, actually. I wouldn't blame the guy, but it came out of the University of Edinburgh. A um, guy called Tree was looking at superposed epoch analysis of solar cycles, trying to figure out what the baseline of solar activity was in 100 years ago. If you do the same trick and try to estimate what the fiducial time is, what's the key time? All the data should stack up on top of itself if you've got an organized system. Well, guess what? It pretty much does for 140 years. So what's going on at 55 degrees? I don't know. Do you know? So I think I'm almost done. But this is what kind of fascinates me right now. Why is it doing it? If you time your mission to high latitudes at the right time, you can see this phenomenon happening. Is 55 degrees the seat of the dynamo? Have we been looking in the wrong place for a long time? If it is, then in answer to Thomas's question, well, it won't take three days, but in a couple of months, you may be able to see the buildup of flux. You may be able to see the initiation of the rush to the poles. You'll also be able to see the start of the butterfly because those longitudinal movies are beautiful. And in terms of um, Carol's elevator point, you're looking at the seat of the dynamo. It's not at mid-latitudes, it's up at high latitudes and we have to characterize the living snot out of it. So, I'll leave this playing, I think. That was my last slide. I'll take any questions. And I'll go have a cup of coffee now and calm down. Uh, we've got Leif, if you can use the uh, mic. Yeah, that was uh, very nice. I want to point out that most of what you said was covered more than 40 years ago. And uh, we introduced at that time something called a hail boundary on the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, and the proper definition of that is that part of a sector boundary in the photosphere where the polarity change is the same as between uh, leading and following sunspots. So that's pieces of the polarity uh, line. And it turns out that flares cluster very strongly at those hail portions. Um, that lately we have repeated that analysis with flares uh, observed by RESI. And uh, it turns out that there's, uh, clustering is extremely strong. And um, we have a recent 
paper, um, Anna Hudson and so on, just coming, coming out, that shows that this clustering changes um, from cycle to cycle, just as it should, because the hail polarity uh, uh, laws require that. Uh, so uh, all of this is again shows there's a very strong clustering of flares. Uh, in fact, we have a, a homular diagram going back 150 years as well. Um, actually, even further back, back to 1840. And it shows very clearly the, that we have sort of two systems of rotation, 28 and a half days and 20, 20, uh, 27 days. And they coexist, which means that plotting in Carrington longitudes is somewhat dangerous because it's not a rotation rate that is really there. It's just a statistical uh, average. Right. So, uh, and of, of course, as, as you show, that will cause these longitudes to rip back, back and forth like that. Um, and uh, the conclusion that we draw from that is that why do flares like these places? Um, probably because the magnetic field is already twisted below the uh, photosphere. So what we're really talking about here is something that has its roots in the interior and it's not a surface phenomenon. So. I think we agree with you there. It's always good to reinvent something that's been invented before. <laughs> As we all know, nothing's ever new. So. That's your shame. Uh, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you've reminded us about this phenomenon of nesting of active regions. It's amazing when you go to meetings in the last few years that I've gone to and I've said, you know, every second active region emerges into a pre-existing active region. People go, really? And yes, we've known this for 25 to 30 years. My memory doesn't hold Did that. Did you do that during your thesis? No, it was work? Karen Harvey who was writing her thesis as I was writing mine. We were next to each other when we looked at the data and it's like, yeah, go back to K. Svan, Vic Kazauskas, Karen Harvey. Um, as to bright points, slightly less long ago, 20 years ago or so in my trace days, as, about, as I remember it, before trace, people thought bright points were regions where ephemeral regions came up into the corona. And we said, no, the bulk of the bright points is where opposite polarities in the network come together. If you go to the poles, there aren't many opposite polarities. Right. Therefore, there are fewer bright points, I right. would say. And so I don't think that you can make the statement that there's something different about the supergranulation. There's something wrong, about different about the magnetic population. Right. As to, the, as to the polar crown filament, I would be willing to bet you that's the point where the, f the new polarity is eating in to the residual polar cap polarity. And that's why we see the polar rushes. It's a polarity pattern shifting. Right. That's worth investigating. But much of that data, I think, is already there. Right. I'm not arguing with you. Why not? Uh, Maria? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you extrapolate where the tangent cylinder uh, might be from the tachocline um, at the equator up to the surface, it intersects at latitudes of about 40 to 45 degrees. Um, so I wonder, uh, I think you have some inclination or some, some um, inkling as to maybe why 55 degrees is important, but could you, could you explain like what is the motivating factor? Do you have any idea of why 55 degrees is the magic number? Here. Well, I think it's all to do with the tangent cylinder. Um, I think that I think, it's my opinion, that the polar, the polar circulation and what's going on in the equatorial cylinder are very different. Hmm. And some two, those two things meet. It's like a, a freshwater meeting salt water, right? Somehow there's slop. Not a lot of slop, but there's enough slop. So I think that um, what you're seeing is where d omega by dr equals zero. If you take Mike Thompson's plot, right? If we, could, we I don't have it, I could bring it up. And you look at how those profiles of d omega by dr change, it's almost flat at about 55 degrees. It's zero, 
and it changes sign. So I don't know what the significance of that is necessarily, and it could be to do with the fact that we're only sensitive to one component of the flow, helioseismically. And so I don't know. But I think there's something really fishy going on, and Carol may be right. It could just be a confluence, right? But it may not be. So is it worth exploring? Because we all know that this torsional oscillation starts at 55 degrees, right? And it's synchronized with this stuff because the rush to the poles and the start of that are the same. The bifurcation happens. Something's building up that we're picking up. The question is, is it Nessie, right? Is that the origins of the magnetic field that then becomes the sunspots 12 years later, right? So. All right. Thanks very much. Let's, thanks, Scott. Again, I'm going to push off further discussion until the break. If people want to fight out in the lobby, that's so, awesome. Uh, but uh, we have to prepare for. Oh, let's thank Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And our final talk for the morning is uh, Pete Riley talking about the importance of polar measurements for modeling. Uh, We have the talk in the computer. It looks like it wasn't updated in the oh, Google maybe, Drive. Oh, maybe we have to. Here's a USB drive if you need it, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it's not synchronized yet. Is that on yours? It is on mine. Okay. Is, any, is Cheryl here? Do we know how to update the Google Drive very quickly? I guess it doesn't automatically update. We just loaded it. Okay. Let's use the, let's use the okay. USB stick. Bring a top hat and a cane. To work in it. So I should be able to play it just off this. Should work. Okay. And we have some time. So. so if there's any glitches or whatever, we'll just bring it up and start it again. All right. Do you have your mic on? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, good morning. So because we had the talks yesterday uh, morning and afternoon, I've been able to um, change my uh, talk so that I don't repeat some of the same stuff that um, uh, Chip in particular talked about and Michael. Um, so that's got the advantage that you won't have to see uh, this material repeated again, but it has the disadvantage that I might be um, saying things off the cuff that might not make any sense. So um, what I'm going to try and do is focus on a couple of things. Um, first, why uh, modelers need a polar mission, um, and that'll be a, a repeating theme throughout the slides, and I'll come back to in the at the end. But I'd also like to focus more importantly on what we've called the open flux problem. Uh, and originally, I'd called this the the missing solar flux problem because it sounded more astrophysical, like there was some there was some cool underlying physics associated with it. But it's not. It's really it's a problem with the models, and it's a problem that uh, all of the global models. Uh, suffer from, um, and which is basically if you drive a model with a photospheric observation um, of the, using the, the magnetic field, uh, whether it's a potential field or MHD, whether or not it's uh, a polytropic, it's got energy, it's got energy transport, whether or not it's got wave turbulence, you still predict that the interplanetary magnetic field at 1 AU is about half, um, sometimes even more, a third of the value that's actually measured by in situ spacecraft. So it's a real um, it's a real deficiency in the, the models, and it's something that we all have to deal with, and we deal with in different ways. I think that, um, that a polar mission could resolve that, and it would answer the Zabukin question um, very, very quickly. OK, so first to talk about the, um, about the, the, the basic issue that we have with uh, current models, in particular the MHD models. As Chip mentioned, um, we can't see the poles of the sun, even though we can create these nice maps from various observatories. And it looks like, it, in particular, when you use a sine latitude, which is what you see when you look at the sun, it doesn't really seem like there's much of a problem over the poles, OK? Because you see a lot of that scatter up here that looks like the scatter that's down at low and mid latitudes. But it really is an issue. And it's something that our group has, has since the early 90s, before I was even part of that group, um, has struggled with in, in how you take the mid latitude fields and you um, extrapolate up to the poles 
to provide a polar field um, that is uh, as accurate as you can make it. And as Carl has just said, that if you don't get those polar fields right, you don't get the, the sector structure, you don't get the, the magnetic field right in the, in the, um, in the heliosphere. Um, this is even more apparent if you actually plot it versus latitude. And so these are just some, um, some counting rotations that we used to do some modeling when we were looking at the, um, some stereo uh, observations. And you can see that for modeling purposes, we take what's a very complicated map and we simplify it. But even there, we know that the structure up here, but beyond these latitudes, we really don't have any confidence in the observations. And so we've tried a, um, a lot of different ways of extrapolating from just simply taking the lower order moments of the field and extrapolating those up to the poles so that we get to basically a dipole at the, the magnetic pole um, to including some kind of diffusion and filtering of the field to try and retain some of the structure that we think that we see. And we know that there is structure there from the Hinode observations, even from the, um, from the, um, the magnetogram observations. We know that there's something more that we're, um, that we're not including. But we've never really been clear, uh, we've never really understood how important it was. So the open, um, the open flux problem really is a way of capturing this deficiency in our model that we don't know, uh, that, that we can't predict a, a basic uh, strength in the, in the interplanetary magnetic field. And it's, it's hampered us for a long time. But we thought maybe um, there's, a, there's a, a practical way of, of fixing it. Uh, you could multiply the magnetograms by some constant factor. The problem with that is it, if that's not the right thing to do, if the magnetograms really are that lower value, then you're changing the physics because you're, you're changing the proportion of the various pressure terms, and that's going to make a difference in the structure that you predict in the solar wind. Um, you might say that there's some underlying physics that you really don't understand, and so you'll do the best that you can do with what you've got available, um, in which case maybe you can just uh, fudge the um, the predictions at one AU and multiply everything by a factor of two or a factor of three, and, and then just admit that um, it's something that you can't fix. So in a study that John did um, last year where he, he wanted to, to look into this and test a couple of ideas, um, well, let me, let me just first say, so the, the, the comparison that we make with the 1AU, 1AU observations in situ is the field that's measured. And obviously, that's measured on, you know, on time scales of a second. So we average that over a long enough time period. So if you take a Carrington rotation average of the, um, of the radial magnetic field, you can then compare that with the total open flux that you calculate across a sphere at some, some reference radius, and then divide that by 4 pi r squared to convert that into Gauss or nanoteslas. And that's a way for you to compare what the MHD, or the potential field source surface results, um, would say um, is the field at 1 AU, and compare that directly with the observations. So from the modeling perspective, the two major constraints that we have, and this shows you how data starved we are, is that um, we know that the coronal holes, or I guess as, as Michael said yesterday, um, coronal holes mean, the term means different things to different people. But if we, if we assume that the, the coronal holes that you see in EUV measurements are a reasonable proxy for the open and closed fields the boundaries are, um, then you would be able to compare what we compute as the coronal holes from the model and compare those with the EUV observations. And they shouldn't measure up. Maybe you could say that the, the um, the EUV observation should provide some limit, um, and maybe it's not an exact one-to-one -one correspondence. But we think that that is a fairly serious constraint um, that the models have to adhere to. And as we've spoken about, the open flux predicted by the model should match what we see at 1AU. So to go through the, the process uh, very quickly, um, these are um, stereo and um, SDO observations combined at 195 and 193 to give you a synoptic map. Uh, Ron Kaplan uh, came up with a nice um, algorithm for detecting the boundaries of the coronal holes. That's what you can see. Uh, this is for counter rotation 2098, so about the July 2010 time period. Um, and you can see that it does a good job of capturing what your eye would pick out as the coronal holes in the observations. So we can take that down here. This would be the um, this would be our um, observed or inferred coronal hole um, map. We can compare that with uh, an MHD result and see whether or not the, the two match. Um, 
beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So you can look at this and, and say that that's a good comparison, or you can, you can say that, no, there's some serious differences. Uh, there are some serious differences, but overall, I think it says that there's some value in, in using the model. Um, but this over predicts the size of the coronal holes. We'll come back to whether or not that might be reasonable for it to actually do that. But let's say that, that it's not, and that really it should match them one for one. Final thing, we, we use the 1AU observations. So these are in black is one hour averaged, in red is one day averaged, in green is seven day averaged, and that's Carrington rotation averaged. Those are the size of the windows. And you can see that during this time period, this is uh, approximately 80 days, that um, we, would, uh, we would hope that the models are able to get about two, maybe, um, you know, maybe from point, point, uh, 1.7 to 2.2, but around two nanoteslas is what the model should be able to predict. Now, the models have got built-in free parameters. So there, there are knobs in the models that you can twist and you can change the answer. Here's a simple example with a potential field source surface, which is the easiest one to conceptually think about. Typically, the, the source surface is set to about 2.5 solar radii. That was certainly the case in the Ulysses days. Um, as we went into this more unusual um, solar minimum around 2008, 2009, people started to adopt a lower value for that, about 2.0. Um, you can see that the effect of bringing down that, that source radius, which is the radius in which the field lines are all assumed to be radial, opens up larger coronal holes. You can even drop it down to 1.4 and then 1.3, and you can see the net effect is opening up further and further holes. But we can see the coronal holes in the UV observations, so it's not like we can pick this one if that's the one that gives the best match with 1AU observations of the field. So, so this is one way that you could constrain um, the model and, and still have some flexibility in terms of tuning it. So we did this for a large number of cases. Uh, down here is, are the maps that we use. So you can see that we've used everything from um, Gong Directly, ADAPT, MDI, um, and then the different models, potential field source surface at different radiuses, um, and the MHD. Uh, and this was our thermodynamics model that we used to, 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 to make these solutions. Okay. Here is the open flux that we calculated using the Omni data set, so about two nanoteslas. And these are the predicted values from all of these different combinations. And without going through all of the numbers in this, um, in this chart, uh, the point to make is that none of these come close to 2.0. Uh, the, the, the two that do come closest, perhaps this one, 1.91, this is the potential field source surface solution with a radius of 1.3. And we know from that previous slide that there's no way that that's going to be consistent with the observations. Now, another way of doing this is to say, OK, well, we know where the coronal holes are. We can observe those, OK? So we can get a coronal hole map. We know, where the, uh, we know what the magnetic field is over the entire um, sphere of the sun. So we can overlay those observed coronal holes on the photospheric field, avoid the map, uh, avoid the, the, the modeling completely, and then we can just sum up what the open flux is within all of these regions. And it, it, you can see, for the most part, um, there are a couple of places where there's, um, there's both polarities of the field there. But, but overall, um, these are where um, they're all of one sign and then all of the other sign. Um, do we get 2.0 um, nanoteslas for those? Um, so this is for a, a selection um, of those maps. And you can see that when we look at the open flux, um, we get even lower values. So there's even more missing flux if we do that kind of a, um, of a comparison. So it, it seems like this really is a, um, a, a, a serious problem. So how do we resolve it? Well, here are two um, ideas that we, that we proposed. One is that, the, and um, you know, others have thought about as well, observations that are, are used to produce an estimate of the field in the photosphere systematically underestimate what that is. Um, and we've known, and life has known for a long time, that what you call the magnetic field in the photosphere in a Carrington map is often not. Um, and people have, have uh, adopted different ways. Some people have taken correction factors from one observatory, applied it to a different observatory, because it gave them the right answer. It gave them the right value for the, for the field at 1AU. Um, we obviously don't think that that's right. And at least for low and mid latitudes, there's no way, um, I think, that you can, you can argue that th there's a conspiracy theory with all of these um, solar researchers where they've, they've either bootstrapped or conspired to have these, these lower than, than measured values. They use lots of different techniques to, to compute the fields. So instead, the only possibility is that maybe there is a component of the field that we can't see very well, 
that's actually providing a lot of the field that we observe at 1AU. And it turns out that a, a natural place for that is in the poles because we can't see them. And that's actually the main point of, of this talk. OK, another, uh, another set of ideas is that um, maybe the flux isn't rooted within these regions that we think of as open, which we see as just being dark in emission. Okay, in that case, maybe there are some issues with coronal hole detection. And I think that that's a, a perfectly valid argument. I think that is the case. John, in, in this paper last year, went through some analysis to show that if that is happening, it's probably only a small effect, maybe 5%, maybe 10%. But, but it can't account for that factor of two. And then the other thing is time-dependent effects. So if you really have a, a sun that's, um, that's, that's, that's producing slow and variable solar wind through interchange reconnection, that's not being captured by the steady state models. And so maybe by, if those processes are occurring on small enough scale, but in the aggregate are contributing to, to open flux, then that might account for it. There's a, another idea, too, that maybe what we're measuring at 1AU really isn't just that simple field line that's meandering out through the sun. If it meanders out to 1AU and then doubles back on itself and then comes back out again, that would be a way of doubling the flux just from that field line, while at the same time it wouldn't um, be messing with your counter-streaming superthermals, which would then say that you know, you, you know, if you have field lines that come back on themselves, you would see counter-streaming in both directions. That's even more speculative. So let's go to the idea that maybe there's this um, largely unobserved uh, extra flux at the poles. What would be, if that, if that were true, what would be the implications of that? So here is a picture um, from a, a, a magnetogram that we processed um, to run some MHD and potential field source surface solutions. The typical way that we do, we take the best measurements that we can. Uh, these, are adapt, uh, these are MDI solutions that we're using for this one. Um, and then we do a little bit of um, diffusion and filtering, but we try and keep as much structure as we can over the poles. And you can see that there is a, a polar region. The fields are relatively small, about three gauss of the typical fields over the poles. Now, instead, let's add some um, unipolar but, but concentrated bundles of flux just to this small region over the poles. Now, that's difficult for the models to handle. We, we can do that with the potential field source surface solutions. But for the MHD models, it's a, that's a little bit more challenging. So instead, we can also take this and we can um, uh, smear it out to give roughly the same total amount of flux that would be contained in here, but is in a more manageable way for us to, to be able to model using the, the, the MHD uh, approach. What would be the implications of that if you were looking from the Earth? Okay. This is from the equatorial plane. So worst case scenario, if you're looking directly at the sun in its equatorial plane, uh, this is the original one. This is the one where we've added that flux. There's no way that you would be able to see that. Okay? It would be perfectly hidden. If you tilted it by 7.25 degrees, so the maximum extent that you could get from the ecliptic plane, that's what you'd be able to see. Again, I think with the, with the noise, and, and particularly with the fact that most of the observations that we're looking at are line of sight, that's, again, something that you're never going to see. Um, if, you, uh, if you took a um, solar orbiter um, trajectory uh, when it was at, say, 30 degrees, getting up towards the, the maximum extent, then this is what you would be able to see. And I think probably at this point, if, something, if a structure like this was there, you would be able to see it. If you had something over the poles, obviously, it would look like this, and there'd be no question that you could see it. So what are the implications? So if we take all of each of those maps and we run some cases, MHD and, and, and um, PFSS solutions, what are the kind of um, implications in terms of the coronal hole area and the flux that we measure at 1AU? Well, first, here are the three maps in that same thing, uh, in the same way. So this is a map of the original one. This is where we've put in the very small scale concentrated bundles of flux. And here's the smeared out one. OK, and you can see that originally the field strength at 1AU um, was, was, was computed to be 1.1 um, nanotesla. If we do the, um, the model where it's got the concentrated bundles over the poles, we get 2.13. And if we do it with a smeared out version, which by smearing it out ends up meaning that the fields are a little bit less, you get 1.99. But those are only ballpark numbers. That, that nothing's being tweaked or anything to make this work out, to make it more appealing. Um, but it seems like this is certainly a large enough effect now, if you look at the coronal hole area, there isn't a substantial change in the coronal hole area between those three solutions. So it's not impacting the size of the coronal holes. You're putting all the flux in within this large coronal hole. So we're talking about predominantly solar minimum configuration. 
and that's producing all of that flux is is um, super radially expanding and coming down to the ecliptic plane and it's adding to the flux that we observe. So it definitely seems plausible and it doesn't violate any of those constraints that we started out with. So how can we test it? Well, there's a couple of ideas um, that we've had. Uh, the first one is to look at the stalks of, of streamers. So these are two um, dipolar streamers. This is a, a pseudo streamer. And to look at where they are um, in the plane of the sky so this is with no flux added. This is with this um, strong, um, I shouldn't say parasitic. It should be um, strong bundles of, of flux. Um, and you can see that as you go from two here to here, you can see that the net effect is the stalk is pushed down towards, um, towards the equator. And that makes sense. You're putting all of this extra um, um, flux at the poles. And so that's going to create a transverse pressure gradient. And it's going to push these stalks towards the equator. Um, and it's true also when you do the smooth flux added. So that's a prediction that the, the, model will over, the model will not be able to push down the stalks towards equatorial latitudes as much as the observations actually suggest. So is that borne out in reality? So what I did was originally I looked at myself and I, and I found five or six great cases that went, OK, I, I'm, I've proven this. So instead then we had a, an undergraduate student and I explained what the process was he needed to do, but I didn't tell him what the significance either way. So it was a single blind study um, that this student did. And I had him measure each of um, the best observed streamers that were, that, that, so we had a one-to-one -one match between um, the model results and the observations. And we've got a, a nice um, extensive table of those observations on our website. And he went through and he calculated the latitude of all of the ones from 2007 to the end of 2008, so the late declining phase of the, of the last solar minimum. And if you look at the, the delta theta between the, um, the inclination of the model versus the observation, um, this was that distribution. And so if there were no difference, if there were no difference, you would expect it to be zero. Okay, if they were both predicting them to be at the same inclination, the same latitude. On the other hand, we found a strong uh, asymmetry in the positive sense, meaning that the model was predicting that these stocks were at higher latitudes than the observations. And statistically, this was a significant result. So uh, the sample t-test showed that th this, this isn't consistent with it being close to zero. It definitely is a non-zero um, result. So um, a second way to, to look at this, OK, so, so we've shown that the stocks are definitely um, not pushed down as much as they should be. But that also suggests something about the expansion factor. OK, so if you've got, a, um, if you've got a, a model that includes this extra flux, those field lines should expand more super radially than, than the one without the, the extra flux. Um, so we can calculate the expansion factor from the model. It's very easy. You trace along the field line. You see how much the field decreases. And you look at that ratio, and that gives you the expansion factor. But from white light observations, it's a little bit more difficult. And I'm not sure if people have done this before, but we tried to come up with a technique for doing that. And I don't want to stand between you and your coffee. So I'm, I'm going to run through this a, a little bit more quickly. But these are the field lines. And this is a, a Druckmuller um, observation of the 2010 eclipse. And so cycling between the two, this is the case where there was, um, where there was, there was no uh, extra field. And you'll have to use your own eyes to decide whether or not the structures look the same in the model in this case versus the other. I, I can show that, I, I can suggest that in this pseudo streamer, um, it gets that completely wrong. But, and this is a case with no added flux. But on the, um, on the east side, it gets both of these streamers much better. When you're looking in the, in the open field regions, it's hard to say. Um, again, it's, um, it's qualitatively, I, I could make the argument both ways. And similarly, when we add the flux to the model solutions, now it seems to mess up this east side, but it seems to do a much better job with that pseudo streamer. So we have to come up with a more, with a more quantitative way of making this comparison. So to do that, I tagged a bunch of field lines um, and then tried to overlay those as best as I could on the observations and then trace along field lines that were as close to those as possible and generate a set of, obviously, these aren't field lines. This is a white light image. So it, it's, it, it's density, but it's, it's hopefully a fiduciary, a good fiduciary of where the field lines are, are laying. So from that, and from the geometry, we can now calculate what the expansion factor is from the white light observations. And what we'd like to know is whether or not that's consistent with the no flux added or the flux added solution. And it turns out, unfortunately, we can't distinguish between the two. So if we look at the observations between the north and the south polar regions, we're just looking in the polar regions, the, um, 
the blue and the, the purple, you can see that they're kind of scattered all the way through this. This is expansion factor versus the clock angle away from the, from the north or the south. Um, and you can see that they're scattered all through this. When we have the added flux solutions, you can see that they're at, at larger expansion factors, which we'd expect. And the um, no added flux are at lower. So there's, there's definitely a, a separation between the red and the green, which we'd expect. But based on this, we can't delineate between which ones match the observations better. So an inconsistent result, but, but nothing um, that's um, contradictory. So what would a polar mission see above the poles? Um, well, hopefully we'd see something like this, which would be great because it would, it would show that it, it would help us to understand why we've got this open flux problem with the models, and it would fix it for us as well. Um, in general, um, to summarize, um, it, as people have mentioned already, it would contribute to a, a, a more synchronic set of maps, which is what we want. We want observations of the entire sun at the same time, not these observations that are built up over a Carrington rotation or even a fraction of a, of a Carrington rotation. Um, you know, the MHD calculations, it's d by dt. We, we need to have the, the entire boundary condition specified at one time. Uh, and we've demonstrated over the years through different mission concepts, all the way from Sentinels through some of the L5 missions that are coming up now, why it really is the key deficiency of the models. Um, so we've got all of that um, as, as arsenal if we want to make the case that it's important from the modeling. Um, so it might resolve the open flux. Um, obviously, as people have said, it's going to undoubtedly um, show us some really new cool stuff. And at, at least for me, if we get this mission, it would keep me employed a little bit longer. Um, all right. So, but the last point I'd like to make is that um, based on the, the discussion we're having yesterday afternoon, I don't think that a polar perspective mission is the right call. I think that this should be a global solar mission. So I think it should combine L5 and, and stereo with multiple polar um, orbitals. Um, and the reason, I think, is that it would truly be synoptic then. So if we really could see the entire sun at one point, that would be great. Important, and I don't think um, is, is appreciated, is that we need the same magnetographs to be making these measurements. If you've got different magnetographs, as, as we saw at the very beginning, they give different answers. So you're not going to get the same numbers from them. But if you've got exactly the same instrument, even if they're both wrong, they'll both be wrong by the same amount. So that, that's a big help. Um, I think it combines the best bits of the science and the forecasting. It's bigger, better, bolder than either of the L5 or the polar missions alone. I think it would answer any of these Zabukin questions. Um, we also have a, currently a strong advocate at NASA, if you look at the previous bullet. So it might be the time to do something that's bigger and bolder. Um, also, politically and in terms of, the, of the, the public, I think that now is a good time for us to capitalize on the interest in space weather, especially if we're going into a more under minimum. Another five or 10 years, and then, then we, we, it may not be as interesting. And as you know, the time to invest in this kind of infrastructure isn't when you have a major disaster. It's in anticipation of it. So I think the timing is good as well. And I also think that based on, on what Noah said yesterday, maybe it's something that with the right combination of instruments could be done cheaply. Um, and also, I think um, this was mentioned this morning. I, I think it might be Scott. Or did you mention it? But um, if we compare this with meteorology, which we're beginning to do more and more with space weather is transitioning, um, it's not that just more data is better. It really can be a game-changing um, state. So, so having doing the entire thing properly rather than piecemeal as we've been doing it might be worth, uh, that might be a good argument. And I think that maybe the best part is that it's a, it's a great slogan, GSM will save your GSM. So that's it. For one question, and then we should all go get our coffee. So Carl, if you want to come up to the mic. of a really big problem. I think your, your models uh, relax to an instantaneous magnetogram. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, Duncan Mackay and Anthony Yates a few years ago were using sequences of magnetograms to see how in a magnetofrictional model the corona gets stressed and blows up uh, somewhat into more open flux. And I think they could almost double the flux by doing that. So, from your perspective, how important is continuity of measurement and continuity of modeling for what we're trying to accomplish? Right, so that, that is a good point. Um, so we've just started looking at the uh, time-dependent solutions over um, longer timescales. And, and I think that that is going to be, for us, the next 
major break, breakthrough. Um, but at the moment, the only thing we can use are the ADAPT um, uh, maps. And, and so they're, they're the best um, kind of poor man's version of a synchronic map, and they're on a cadence of two hours. But yeah, we should be able to see that. I don't, John has done a calculation over about a year, and I don't think he's seen a, a substantial buildup in the flux that we see at 1AU. Um, but that was done actually before this study, so it may be that that wasn't on his, on his mind. So it might be worth looking at that and seeing. All right, let's thank Pete for a great expose of uh, consequences of fixing the polar field problem. Uh, so <clears throat> today I will try to impress upon you on why we need to make soft X-ray observations from a polar mission, uh, and in particular, spectrally resolved soft X-ray observations. Uh, we do have lots of soft X-ray imaging for, uh, for the sun from Earth, but uh, soft X-ray spectroscopy is something that uh, is has been lacking a lot in prior years uh, and that we need to improve upon. Uh, we're doing that from Earth perspective, and I think it would be very beneficial for doing it from the poles. So I'll go ahead and give you all the meat up front so you can sleep through the rest of the talk. Uh, but uh, soft X-ray observations, particularly spectrally resolved, uh, provide us with sensitivity to coronal temperatures from a million degrees all the way to tens of millions of degrees. The entire coronal temperature range is accessible to the soft x-rays. And additionally, soft x-rays also probe the abundances of many hot ions, including iron, magnesium, silicon, uh, as well as the harder to ionize elements like oxygen, carbon, neon, argon. Um, and we have all of those in the soft x-rays. In particular, soft x-rays provide us with unique diagnostics that are not accessible to the EUV. We've been focusing a lot on EUV because it's very easy to make nice images with them, but in the soft x-rays, we get sensitivity to the few million degrees up to 10 million degrees where the EUV is far less sensitive because there are many fewer lines sensitive to those temperatures. Um, and we also get line blends in the x-rays uh, because every instrument has finite resolution, the line blends in x-rays are all from similar temperature ranges, as opposed to in the EUV, where you can get line blends of chromospheric and coronal lines, or uh, coronal lines from 1 million degrees and 20 million degrees right next to each other. Additionally, in the soft x-rays, we also have continuum emission from hot plasma, and that helps provide even stronger constraints on trying to do temperature inversions to understand what is the temperature and the abundance of the emitting plasma. All of this comes together to make soft x-rays ideal for studying things like coronal heating. And although it may not seem like it, uh, it's also ideal for multi-messenger studies of the origins of solar wind uh, ions, as I'll mention. So soft x-rays from the sun are highly variable in space and in time. You can see here examples uh, from, uh, from the uh, XRT on Hinode spanning from solar minimum all the way up to solar maximum. Even during solar minimum, when you think that there should be nothing in x-rays on the sun, you still see a lot of x-ray emission coming from bright points, coming from a halo of hot coronal gas around the sun. Uh, there is a lot of structure there, and it varies in time over time scales from minutes for flares to days and weeks for active region evolution. Uh, and of course, it's also variable in space, although that's less relevant to what I'm going to talk about here uh, for this talk. Uh, and apparently, uh, there we go. Uh, and it's also highly variable in spectrum. Uh, you can see here two examples of highly disparate activity. One example is a soft X-ray spectrum from solar minimum in 2009. Uh, and one example is uh, near solar maximum with lots of bright active regions on the disk. These are two separate instruments, but put on the same scale. Uh, and you can see that not only do the intensities vary by orders of magnitude, but the shape of the spectrum varies. Uh, and that's very important, as I will get to in just a couple slides. Additionally, uh, as I mentioned, we sample lots of high temperature lines. You can see here an example of all of the lines from Chianti uh, spanning from 1 to 55 angstroms. Uh, and you can see here there, there are lots of uh, ions of iron, magnesium, neon, carbon, whatever you want is right here. Uh, and in particular, a lot of these are very important for solar wind origins, such as uh, oxygen 7, carbon 5, carbon 6. Um, and they're very important for temperature diagnostics as well. So we sample all of that very sensitively. So what does that 
bring us to in terms of science. So with coronal heating, we've been studying the hot corona for more than 80 years now, uh, and we still don't really understand why it's hot. Uh, we have various leading theories. We have nanoflares, we have wave heating, there are other possibilities. Uh, we don't know which ones are necessarily active in what parts of the sun and over what time scales. There is evidence from a lot of recent missions, particularly using soft and hard x-rays, of hot plasma in active regions going up to 10 million degrees or more that suggests that nanoflare heating is very prevalent in active regions. But coronal holes are something we know almost nothing about, uh, in part that's limited by the fact that they're dark and there aren't a lot of photons, uh, and that makes measurement of the coronal holes very difficult. There is evidence from solar uh, wind measurements that those should actually be fairly hot uh, plasma because the ions are, are, have high charge states. Um, but uh, it's difficult to measure those things with EUV. You can see here an example. Uh, here is the polar coronal hole, and this is a DEM inversion using the latest and greatest techniques. Uh, you can ignore the thing down here at the bottom, but you can see that even in the coronal hole, there are no solutions for most of the pixels in the coronal hole. Uh, EUV does not provide the sensitivity we need, whereas soft x-rays can. Uh, soft x-rays, as I mentioned, are very strongly dependent on what the heating mechanism is. Here we have examples of what differential emission measures might look like for steady heating, as you might expect from waves, uh, or two different nanoflare distributions. And you can see here the resulting spectra coming off of each of these distributions is very discriminatory. Uh, you can tell easily from the spectral shape, the intensity, and the lines uh, which of these uh, uh, nanoflare models or wave heating models generated that spectrum. And again, that's reminiscent of something that we've already measured here in solar minimum. Uh, you might expect this to be a steady wave heating type scenario. Here with, the, uh, with active regions, you might expect that to be a nanoflare heating scenario. Uh, so why do we need the polar perspective? As we've heard in talks in prior days, uh, coronal holes are difficult to observe for a number of reasons. Uh, in the EUV, it's partly because of this wall effect where you are observing at different angles, you have emission at, at large altitudes, and your line of sight is integrating through uh, higher altitudes, which include EUV emission, even if the coronal hole does not. Uh, and in fact, the other problem is that in the equatorial regions, things evolve very quickly. You can see here an AIA image from uh, just two days ago. Looking at one day prior, and I'll flip back and forth between these, you can see that the shape and extent of the coronal holes appears to change very dramatically just from one day to the other. Partly that's because of the different perspective that you get as uh, the, the uh, sun rotates uh, around the equator, but partly it's also because there's a lot of uh, dynamics around the equator, and that does not happen in the, the polar regions where you can see there uh, are very few differences apart from the things changing in longitude. In the x-rays, it's even harder. You can see that the equatorial coronal holes are almost impossible to see. Partly that's scattered light in the instrument, and partly that's because the x-ray emission is far more diffuse. Higher up in the altitude, you're looking through a longer line of sight, uh, and so uh, the polar coronal holes actually will provide you with a much a uh, cleaner perspective on what coronal hole emission might be. And you can imagine if you're going over the poles, you're looking at almost a full disk of hole emission, as opposed to a full disk of not hole emission and trying to isolate what that little cap looks like. So a polar perspective is required to better isolate uh, this emission. And as we heard from uh, Heather Elliott uh, and a couple of others yesterday, coronal holes also seem to correlate with differences in the charge states of solar wind ions and the abundances of solar wind ions. But it's not clear what is driving those differences. Is it because uh, the boundary conditions between the hole and the uh, uh, closed corona are generating different uh, charge states and, and different temperatures? Is it within the coronal hole and we're seeing propagation effects as we pass over because it's hard to tell when you're at 1AU, for example, uh, whether the particles you're measuring are coming from particular points on the, on the sun. Uh, additionally, are these differences driven by temperature differences at the surface, or are they propagation effects where the solar wind is getting accelerated, possibly ionized on its way out, and not ionized uh, down below? So do these ions start out highly charged and get accelerated, or do they start out less charged and get further uh, ionized on their way out? 
The only way to measure that is by actually looking at the corona with remote sensing observations. And we can then uh, get temperature and abundance and charge state measurements at the origin of where these particles are coming out. That's something we can do with the soft x-rays. Uh, so just to give you two brief examples of how we've made these measurements recently, uh, the Minx uh, CubeSat miniature x-ray uh, solar spectrometer launched from uh, the ISS uh, about a year ago. Sorry, two years ago now, uh, and made a, a, years of ob a year of observations with a spectrometer that's the size of your hand. Uh, and it, can, it makes measurements like these. Uh, and you can see here a lot of the lines, although it's uh, very blurry, you can see here a lot of the lines that I was talking about that you can identify in these kinds of spectra. Uh, MINX 2 is scheduled to launch later this year and will make these kinds of observations uh, from, from an Earth orbit uh, for about four years. But if you want to get to longer wavelengths, photon counting uh, detectors are much more difficult to use. So we have the uh, CubeSat uh, called Cubix. It uh, also includes an imaging spectrometer, uh, which works on a diffractive principle. So Chandra has a diffraction grating uh, and disperses spectra. We can actually apply that same stellar measurement to the sun uh, to get something like this, where you disperse uh, individual regions and bright points spectrally on your detector uh, to get a, a, a zeroth and first order uh, overlapping image. We already know how to analyze these kinds of things and you can uh, achieve this uh, fairly cheaply and fairly simply from small instruments. So to summarize, we can fly small soft x-ray instruments that are inexpensive and they require low resources. Uh, and that's perfect for a polar mission. It's sensitive to high temperatures. It's sensitive to abundances. That provides us with unique insights into coronal heating as well as solar wind origins that we cannot get from EUV and we can't get without looking at the corona. Uh, and we can scale these up if we have more resources uh, to whatever needs to be done. Thanks. Thanks very much. We do have time for one or two questions while Dan comes up. I'll ask a quick question, which is we've already heard that there aren't very many bright points over the pole. Uh, what do you expect to see in terms of X-ray bright points or nano flares? Uh, well, I, I think it's what we don't know that we're going to see that, that's the more interesting thing. Uh, you know, I, as we mentioned, it's, it's hard to look at uh, uh, coronal holes in the X-rays uh, in the equatorial region. And in the polar region, we're looking at it through uh, a, a fairly long line of sight and at an oblique angle. Uh, I would expect that there would be bright points. We do see them. Uh, how they relate, for example, to the uh, supergranulation network, who knows? Uh, I think making that observation is, uh, opens up discovery space that we need to explore. All right, super. Next up, we have uh, Dan Seaton, who's going to be talking about uh, zooming in on the coronal holes with solar orbiter. Coronal poles. Poles, excuse me. Holes, too. The coronal poles, not holes. Let's see. Which one's yours? EY. There it is. All right. Where's the, where's the go on this thing? Oh, it's already here. Okay. So you switch. Okay. I think I just did the wrong one then. No, it's cool. There's probably another one right there. Yep. Keynote. There we go. Perfect. OK. OK. Um, so before I say anything, I have to say that this is basically none of my own work. Uh, I can't take any credit for it. I'm really here uh, representing my colleagues uh, who work on the um, extreme ultraviolet imager that's going to fly on Solar Orbiter. And in particular, uh, uh, on behalf of Matt West, who's done a lot of interesting stuff and wanted to be here but couldn't make the trip. Um, but they thought you would be interested potentially to hear about uh, the mission and they're thinking about what might be uh, interesting for the mission um, because I think it's going to inform uh, maybe some of the decisions that, that are made over the course of the next several years about what we should be looking for at the poles. So uh, to give you just a quick overview of Solar Orbiter, uh, this is Solar Orbiter. Uh, it has 10 instruments, um, in situ instruments, remote sensing, uh, and of particular interest to us are these uh, extreme ultraviolet imagers, which are highlighted there on the side of the uh, spacecraft. In situ instruments measure particles, magnetic fields, 
remote sensing, uh, extreme ultraviolet, uh, coronagraph, um, uh, magnetograph, uh, heliospheric imagers, and uh, some spectroscopic um, observations. Uh, in fact, Solar Orbiter, uh, as of today, uh, has shipped for pre-flight testing, um, so it's progressing well. Uh, you can see the spacecraft here. Let's see if can... That doesn't work. Uh, you can see the spacecraft there in the upper upper uh, left, uh, the heat shield, um, which uh, has various ports and openings for the remote sensing instruments. Uh, just to give you a sense of how those pieces fit together, that's what it looks like. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, Solar Orbiter uh, has a nominal um, few-year mission with an extended mission, takes the whole thing to about 10 years, uh, and as you know, maybe 35 degrees uh, latitude. This is a schematic that shows how its orbit evolves. Actually, each one of these little loops you see represents a couple of orbits, and then they progressively um, adapt. Uh, so uh, they start out with uh, some fairly close passes of the sun, and then progressively you lose the close passes, but you gain the high latitude coverage. Uh, I should say the green uh, shows the windows when remote sensing instruments operate. They operate for about 10 days uh, at um, uh, perihelion and at the high latitude zones. The rest of the time you get in situ all the time, but relatively limited access to the remote sensing. <laughs> So uh, the extreme ultraviolet imager, it's actually three imagers. There's a full sun imager uh, that gives you the sort of global context all the time. There's a Lyman alpha imager, and there's a very high resolution EUV imager. This is what the instrument looks like uh, on the inside. <clears throat> so the high res is uh, 17 nanometers. Uh, Lyman alpha is Lyman alpha at 121 nanometers. And then there's the full sun imager, which actually can do uh, two different uh, observations, 171 and uh, 304. Uh, the full sun imager is interesting. Uh, it has a very wide field of view. And the reason for this is that uh, it moves along with the um, high res imager. So to keep the sun in the field of view, you have to have a big, a big field of view so you can point anywhere in high res and still see this, the whole sun. But it turns out there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. So this is a mosaic uh, we made. Um, using the uh, ultraviolet imager on Gozar, SUVI. Uh, on the left, on the right is just a 304 image. And you can see, uh, actually, as you point around, uh, this is the sort of nominal pointing. But as you change the pointing, <clears throat> you retain the sun. But actually, there's a lot of interesting EUV structure out there at relatively large heights. So um, FSI should um, provide a, some interesting and new observations of what's happening sort of in the extended EUV corona. Uh, it also has an occulter, so you can take very deep exposures of, um, of the extended corona uh, with, uh, without encountering problems with saturation and other things. The high resolution imager, this is roughly the size of the field of view. Uh, you get about an arc second on two pixels uh, at closest approach, so you're looking at about uh, 200 kilometers. Um, and you get kind of a preview of uh, what we expect to see from high C. The difference is uh, the high resolution imager can observe with up to one second cadence for many hours. And that's, that's great. But the problem is you burn all of your telemetry for the better part of a year by doing that. So one of the really important uh, sort of decision points for operations um, for EUI is, is how you spend your telemetry and which targets you chase. And they have some fairly innovative um, uh, plans to sort of have a scientist in the loop, as we heard a little bit about yesterday, um, who can evaluate very coarse uh, sort of beacon level data and decide what's interesting, what's worth preserving, what's worth sending to Earth. Um, but there are some challenges involved in, these, in, this, in this mission of sort of setting priorities, uh, setting priorities perhaps way in advance of uh, the actual observation and then hoping you get something interesting. Um, it's worth mentioning, along with EUI, uh, in particular, there's the Metis coronagraph, which has a field of view that's roughly what you see in the image there. Uh, and of course, we have magnetograms, which are really, really important. I think the only way we can understand the observations we're going to make uh, is by looking at these magnetograms. And obviously, they're going to, as we've been discussing, we're going to see hopefully a lot of new and interesting stuff, even though we're not going to fly completely over the pole. Um, and I think uh, putting these together give the sort of necessary complete picture um, of what's happening at the poles. So what are we going to see? 
Well, uh, David Bergman's, um, who really is responsible for this presentation, likes to compare this to Juno. You know, Juno, everybody knew you were going to see something interesting, but what would it be? I think this is very similar. The questions, as Amir just said, the, the questions that are the most interesting questions um, that we can answer are probably the ones that nobody has thought to ask yet. So this is real, true discovery science. Um, a couple of questions that might be interesting. Are, are polar coronal holes uh, significantly different from lower latitude coronal holes, and how and why? And in particular, you know, coronal holes, they're not subject to this, this uh, sort of shear that you get from differential rotation. So they evolve very slowly. And the dynamics that drive them are very different. What's going on? What happens when you can watch a coronal hole uh, for you know, 10 days? Uh, you see a significant uh, amount of uh, evolution at the sort of low latitudes. But at the poles, nobody's looked. <laughs> well, that's not entirely true. Uh, people have looked at how coronal holes evolve using a variety of techniques. And one sort of, I think, particularly interesting uh, piece of work is by my colleague uh, Royal, Laurel Rackmiller and Chloe Ganu, who looked uh, off limb, uh, relatively high in the corona using the swap imager on Proba 2, at, at how um, the evolution of the corona uh, and the region above the polar coronal holes happens uh, through the course of the field reversal. And you can see, uh, I can't get a mouse pointer up, but. Maybe this pointer works. No pointers work. Well, you can see in this sort of a schematic, you have the coronal hole, and you have um, streamers with underlying um, uh, cavities that slowly merge into a pseudo streamer, a smaller and smaller pseudo streamer, and finally the reversal has happened. And you can sort of trace that evolution over here on the other side uh, in the UV. What does that look like when you can see it from above and not just in profile? I think that's a pretty interesting question. Now, of course, we won't be able to observe this for um, many months as these observations are, are made, but uh, at least you get a, a view of sort of different states. Other people have actually done a pretty good job of trying to visualize what's happening at the uh, coronal holes near the poles. This is some sort of uh, clever uh, image transformation work by Frederico Scher. Uh, we're looking at 304, so sort of, you know, high chromosphere. This one? This one. Ah, yay. OK. Uh, and you can see sort of uh, two sets of conditions. These are this, this is, the, I think, the southern uh, coronal hole. Uh, and you can see here's the coronal hole at solar minimum. The sun is uh, fairly uniform. And he computes the sort of ratio of brightness between the, um, the equatorial region and the polar region. And you can see it's, it's uh, you know, about 0.8 because the coronal hole is darker. Then at solar max, the coronal hole has, is experiencing this reversal. It's filled in. It's, it's, it's not really a coronal hole anymore. But this ratio stays low because, of course, the, the um, activity has increased at the lower latitudes. He was only able to do this at a, at a few times when the, you know, when the mapping works just right because of the orientation of the sun. We can do this all the time, or at least many more times, and with a lot better uh, sort of resolution. Um, another interesting way to, to do this kind of visualization is work that Matt West has been doing. Um, and basically, he's, he's looking at not just what's happening at the surface, but what's happening higher out in the corona and trying to get a sense of what we might see. So he takes these images from SWAP here, and he more or less blocks out this part of the image. And then he runs through each column in the image and, and stacks up the signal into, a, into an array like this. He takes that array and he, he puts it into, a, into an image. Then he repeats the process on the sun at a slightly later time. He takes the next array, uh, correcting for the rotation. And eventually, he sort of can stitch together a complete image of the sun. And then with some sort of clever interpolation, you get a nice picture. And we can actually watch the coronal hole evolve. Now, this is, this is uh, again, this is sort of the sum uh, in, in 3D space of a lot of different things. It's kind of a sort of poor man's tomography. Uh, but you can see that there's a lot of interesting structure in here. It's, it's faint, but it's there. You can see there are some interesting sort of um, uh, asymmetries. You can see these um, polar crown filaments spiraling around. It gives a little taste of what we might see. Um, and I think it, it, it uh, shows us very clearly that there's interesting things happening at the poles that we have not really been able to study in detail. And of course, 
This is uh, because it's a stack, there's a lot of sort of diffuse, blurry structure that we should see very clearly with uh, EUI. OK, so in closing, uh, just a couple of remarks on how mission planning works in Solar Orbiter. I think it's, uh, it's relevant. And uh, maybe if people in this room have ideas about what uh, should be observed, uh, you want to know this. Because the planning has to happen very far in advance. There's not uh, robust telemetry contacts available all the time. So their planning cycle is uh, greater than six months ahead of time, often. Uh, they do plan to do uh, what they call soups. Uh, uh, basically join operations with other instruments. But they, w once uh, uh, an operation is planned on Solar Orbiter, they got to stick to it. So if you want to join, uh, you have to do your planning in advance and just go along with whatever's there, no matter what happens on the sun. Uh, as I mentioned, there's 10-day um, uh, passes um, uh, for remote sensing at the sort of critical points in the orbits with a, you know, sort of odds and ends here and there else elsewhere, and in-situ data available all the time. There's limited telemetry. Um, there's about 320,000 images uh, that EUI can take in its entire mission. Um, many solar uh, EUV observatories take that many in months. So we're not going to get a lot of data. So we have to target it very carefully. There's an open data, data policy, as I mentioned. They'll get low latency data that they can kind of use to pick out what's most worth preserving and, and what's not. Uh, but it's going to be low quality. Um, and the data will be available uh, to the whole community as soon as it arrives, but you might have to wait six months to get it. So uh, in closing, uh, if you want to reach out to the team and, and uh, get involved in one of these soups or something, here are uh, various people who are uh, able to help you with that. <laughs> All right, that's it. Well, thank you. Again, we have time for one or two questions while Carl comes up. Uh, Don. Could you use the microphone, please? Uh, Spice is uh, in there somewhere, yeah, but I don't know if I'd mentioned it by name. Uh, other questions? Actually, I actually have an additional one, which is we, these are beautiful renderings of the pole from, that you showed from the ecliptic. And of course, Solar Orbiter will go up to 30 in its extended mission, 30 yep. degrees. Uh, what will we see over the poles that we won't see from 30 degrees? Well, I think that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think, uh, one, I think one of the sort of key points is that you still have this wall effect, even at you know, 30 degrees. So you still have to look at things in profile. You have to make some trades with, I don't know, whatever's going on in front. And if we look at, um, I go back, there is a, it's not the best image, but you know, there's a lot of sort of complicated structure up here above the poles in the EUV. Um, that stuff is going to be in the way even at 30 degrees. So it obscures your view of, uh, I think, a lot of the finer structure, a lot of the actual you know, coronal hole features that might be interesting. Um, on the other hand, what's the top-down view of that look like? You know, and what could you do with multi-perspective um, observations? These are big, complicated 3D structures uh, that I think uh, you know, having this view, having the polar view, maybe solar orbiter in the mix. This is really interesting stuff. All right, let's uh, thank Dan again. And now we have uh, Carl Schreiber, who will be talking about a solar stellar perspective on solar polar views. And apologies to Don for yelling at you just now, but I wanted to clarify the reason why we want you to do the microphone is not just so everybody in the room can hear us, but because we're streaming and recording. And so, of course, when you get questions from the audience without a microphone, they become this big gap. So sorry, Don. Thank you. <laughs> so so use a microphone you. to say that. Uh, good. So after Carl's talk, we'll have the panel discussion, and we have rearranged the afternoon schedule a little bit. So lunch will be pushed back just a or few that. minutes from the, the additional uh, length from the, the inserted right. talks. Uh, we'll resume in the afternoon at uh, 1.45 instead of 1.15, giving everyone uh, enough time for both the panel discussion and lunch. So All Dr. Right. Schreiber. Good morning. And now for something completely different. Um, Two years ago, I stepped away from solar physics and started looking at 
what I did originally in my first postdoc here, stars, but also trying to learn about exoplanets. And if I took the charge correctly that Dr. McIntosh gave me, I thought, well, maybe I can contribute something to this meeting by looking at exoplanets. Not so much what we learn about exoplanets, but that the interest in exoplanets and the presence of exoplanets actually helps make the case for the type of mission that we're looking at in this meeting. And in doing that and putting that together, I think I'm going to have to take you past a few things that you know about, magnetic convection and stellar astrophysics, but also the exoplanetary properties and planetary habitability and how all that is tied together. So join me on a little excursion, starting at the sun, going to the planets, but I will come back eventually. The original solar stellar connection was really at its heart about understanding the dynamo, uh, complementing solar observations with stellar data and complementing stellar observations with solar knowledge. We're trying to understand, can we come up with a dynamo model that we still do not have that tells us why stars are as active as they are, um, why there are cycle patterns, and why the sun is so rare in having a full cycle pattern among its peers, why there is such a thing as dynamo saturation, why some stars manage to get these vast spots over their poles, why they can manage super flares that are a thousand times brighter than the brightest we've seen on the sun and all that. And all of that, of course, has to do with trying to understand how the local and global convective codes that we now have can be tuned, improved, and tested against the stellar observations, because that, in the end, gets to the bottom line here, understanding magneto convection, which is, yeah, we're do doing better at flux emergence, but we don't really know why flux emergence starts in a flux bundle in the first place. I don't think we really understand. It's fascinating to, to look at flux transport models and see how well the surface flux transport models move flux about in terms of decay, transport, and cancellation as if those flux tubes were not connected to anything underneath them. On to riding on top of this strong rotational shear layer that sits there, how can that be? Uh, the phenomenon of nests that we talked about a little bit earlier on, and all these other things. So how do we do that? Well, we start at the sun. The pole is one of those regions that we heard yesterday. Yes, we can sort of measure the magnetic fields at the pole. There are experiments where people look at, can we study the supergranulation flow patterns? This is a stitched together version of something that Aaron Birch, I think, showed yesterday. Uh, where we look at different wedges. Whenever the pole was visible, you can see that there are these black patches of upflows and white downflows. There are odd alignments in here that may or may not be real. They may be artifacts. But this does not tell us anything about the mirroral flow at those latitudes, because the length of the observational window we have is insufficient. And it tells us nothing about what happens underneath all of this. People experiment to this day with mirroral advection to tune the patterns that we see at the surface. So maybe there's a counterflow over the pole. Maybe there isn't. Some models need them. Some models don't like them at all. Some people are now trying uh, genetic algorithms to, to tune all the parameters uh, in the flux transport, dissipation, uh, annihilation, and, and uh, transport subject to supergranulation diffusion. And all of those things, again, tell us about the surface not about what sits underneath, not about the dynamo. And among the stellar people, there is this continuing puzzle that whenever you look at a young star rapidly rotating, or a binary star spun up by tidal coupling, as, as long as they're fast rotators, they're very likely to have spots over their poles. And even those spots themselves remain a bit of a mystery, not just in how they can form, but what even what their properties are. We can measure their size but not their polarity patterns. So we came up with a model that said, if on the right-hand side here, this column, that if we just put more and more flux onto the solar surface, but change nothing else, we can create this odd eyeball kind of pattern that if you put, and if you put enough flux close together, maybe it will co coalesce into a sunspot or a star spot. Others say, as in this uh, diagram, that AB door uh, diagram here, would argue that Zeeman Doppler imaging suggests that you actually have mixed polarities over the poles. Well, that kind of advection that we have on the sun doesn't carry both polarities, unless you advect very much faster, or emerge locally, or do something completely different. So there's a big mystery for any young star and any rapidly rotating star as to what's going on. There are some dynamo models that are beginning to do this, that say, well, if you spin fast enough, you can bring flux up along the rotation axis.
Well, yeah, that's a long-standing idea that if you spin fast enough, angular momentum, etc., makes things go parallel to the rotation axis. But how do you test that idea? How do you combine this idea with the solar dynamo model that we still don't have running appropriately? Well, another kind of thing that, that Scott specifically, I think, had to ask, ask me to talk about is we have decades-long observations of calcium H and K activity of stars summarized into what Olin Wilson at Mount Wilson a long time ago started measuring and called the S-index. I think we do have enough information, as diagrams like this are showing, that if we looked at different distributions and imagined that we look at different tilt angles of the rotation axis, yeah, we can probably put together enough information to get that at least out of the way. But how does that help us? OK. Now, on the way to exoplanets. The Academy, a few weeks ago, published a study that said it's basically the exoplanet science strategy. And they gave us a nod by saying, yeah, you can help us. Because what we really would like to understand is how radial velocity signals of the star are seen when we look at different stars of different activity or at different tilt angles. Because that's part of what we're trying to disentangle if we're looking at rotate at radial velocity variations because of orbiting planets. And they also said, yes, if we want to understand habitability, planetary atmospheric evolution, we really need to know at least about, say, the, e, the UV and EUV input in those atmospheres because they help erode the atmosphere. I would imagine, I, I, I think there are many, many more connections here. And many of those connections are, and that's why I'm coming back to this audience, working in two directions, where we can help each other. The easiest to understand is where the connection lies is to say, if there are stars with polar star spots, and you have transits of exoplanets that happen to hit those polar star spots, you're not going to see them, because they're covering a dark spot. Uh, people have done a statistical analysis and said, yeah, that's about right. We, meet, we really need to know about this. How often are how big star spots on, solar, uh, on stellar polar regions present in order to understand the statistics of the orbital inclinations of exoplanets. That's not terribly connected to this particular meeting. This gets closer. In some cases, um, there are now studies where people put a star spot on a star, uh, basically underneath the transit of the planet. And you can measure the intensity variations. And if you do this spectroscopically, you can measure temperature differences. You can actually get information on the spot that is being occulted and is uh, reappearing after the planet transits. It's more interesting in cases like this. This is a case of a star where the rotation axis is strongly tilted relative to the orbital plane of the planet. So there's a strong obliquity in this. There's a strong polar star spot sitting there that people have found because of the Doppler imaging technique. And then, if you, do spectro uh, if you spectro use spectroscopy to observe this system, during a transit, you will see that in this particular case, most of the light taken away happens to be on the red side of the spectrum. That means you're not crossing the star rotating like this. You're crossing the star on the receding hemisphere only. So you can actually get the trajectory across the star, right? And in, some, and in this particular case, I, which I found is, was, was really interesting, um, half a rotation later, that planet transited the spot directly. Now, until this time, these spots had always been inferred from Doppler imaging techniques, never directly measured by an occultation. So having it confirmed to exist, yes, it really is a spot, is not an artifact of the method, uh, was very interesting. This is the point where people are getting to be really audacious about what can be done about exoplanetary atmospheres. Um, we're now looking into a phase where our colleagues are using molecular and atomic lines to learn things about the atmospheres of the planets. So imagine you've got this really tiny planet against this big star with a tiny little shell of atmosphere. And still, they're taking that signal that comes through that atmosphere to learn about those atmospheres. And they're doing this from the deep molecular layers out into the exospheres of these exoplanets. 
Um, they're beginning to use a variety of molecular and atomic spectra, and they're so bold that they're even making statements about the rotation periods of the stars and about cloud and haze layers in, sorry, about the planet and the cloud and haze layers that exist in the planetary atmosphere. Now, all of that signal is, as they would call it, contaminated with information about what sits behind. To us, this means there are literally thousands of known little occulting disks crossing stars that will help us understand the signals that sit behind it. We can probe the properties of spots and plage. We can understand the coherence of star spots. We can understand even the thermal structure going into the chromospheres if you use the right uh, spectroscopic diagnostics. Here's another experiment. When you have, if you look at the diagram on the right-hand side, imagine you have a star like the sun and, a, and a, a tilted rotation axis, and you've got planets going across it like this. If you look at that long enough, you can even see the migration pattern of a potential butterfly diagram. So we can learn about butterfly diagrams on stars wherever you have a strongly tilted orbital plane relative to the rotation axis of the star. Fortunately, that happens mostly for giant planets where the signal is nice and strong. This is where it gets really bold. This is an experiment where people said, OK, let's look at transiting planets spectroscopically in the infrared. We can piece together the signal from the star behind it by saying, we know the surface temperature, we know the, the center of the limb effects, we, can make a guess about filling factors. We can make a guess about atmospheric properties of what chromospheres look like, what their star spots look like. Let's make guesses about the planetary atmospheres, uh, whether there's clouds and hazes, and what kind of molecules are in there. And those are the, the obvious candidates. You can have carbon dioxide, um, methane, water, not yet oxygen. Um, and let's run, that, run these algorithms and see if we can get signatures from either or both of these. And the answer is, in many cases, yes, you get signatures from both of these. You have evidence that both signals are contributing to what you're measuring. Now, this is just the beginning. But I would imagine that the community of the exoplanetary scientists are going to be ever more interested in what sits, what they call their noise. And as the telescopes grow and the instruments get more sensitive, and certainly when James Webb is flying, uh, we may benefit from this by actually seeing active regions and star spots of magnitudes we have no access to on the sun. And all of that helps us in the end, I would argue, as additional arguments why we need solar polar views, or I would really like solar global views, um, to better guide and test any dynamo model that we can come up with, both for the sun and for stars, and to establish spectral radiance maps that are of interest to the exoplanet community. Um, and if I were to weigh, going back to what Scott asked me to address, where is the biggest discovery space in this and the biggest joint leverage? It isn't really in the S-index, I think. But it certainly sits in understanding total solar irradiance. We don't even know if the total solar luminosity is changing, um, depending on the, the coverage with faculae and spots. And in the end, the strongest argument lies in getting dynamo constraints. We need to understand, measure, if we can, from this mission, the flux, emergence, and transport and dissipation properties around the entire sun uh, so that we can, in the end, in fact, drive, I guess what I would call a flux bundle dynamo, a dynamo that actually generates the bundles that create active regions as we see them on the sun. Thank you. I'm in just a minute or two short, so we actually have time for more than one question. Uh, questions on the stellar connection? Scott? Thanks, Carl, for addressing my charge. Um, I'm very fascinated, though, that you know it's like we heard from Life 
some of the stuff that I presented in my talk had been has been floating around for decades, but never been. It was explored decades ago. But I would argue that some of this longitudinal evolution that's so critical, in, in especially in point three here, how you know there's data to be mined, but is that to be should that be our our you know fifteen second selling point that we are going to nail the dynamo by taking this global perspective? I mean, I just, I mean, we need we need a buzz line, right? We need something big to aim at. What's the buzz line? I'm asking, I'm throwing your question back at you. Thank you. But I, I guess I could repeat the argument I made yesterday. Um, something like half of the volume of where the dynamo operates has escaped visibility to date. And the results, as Junwei was showing, from the half or the, that we can see, um, we have disagreements about the flows. Uh, the global convective models don't agree and show a very strong dependence even on the details of the rotation rate. If you, if you tweak, if you, I was trying to read a paper that Nick Featherstone and Mark Mish wrote a few years ago. If you tweak the rotation in their models, tweak the sun's rotation rate by 20%, you can change the direction of the mineral circulation, and you can change the direction of the differential flow. That's really annoying. You need observational guidance to get this. And I think getting, getting and making the argument that this is discovery space where the solar dynamo is concerned, a solar dynamo that not just makes a forecast about the diffuse heliospheric field, but specifically about why there is such a thing as an active region coming up, and why there are such things as nests and active longitudes, is very valuable as an argument. I agree. Yes. It would help to choose a focal point before you make the argument, maybe. Yes. <laughs> Good. Uh, any further questions for Carl? All right. In that case, we'll uh, move to a panel discussion. And poor Carl will have to answer more questions from the chair in the front here. So if the panelists could please come up to the front. We'll uh, discuss some of the results from the morning thematically and uh, carry on to what that implies for, uh, for an upcoming polar mission that we want to specify ultimately. Uh, after that, we'll break for lunch. So uh, panelists, if you could sit, take your seat on the chair here. And Sarah, do we have separate mics for them or do we pass one around? Uh, last time it worked pretty well. We let them take a mic. We had one out here and then You guys pass that around. And everybody else, let's maybe we'll pass it around. Okay. So I thought we had one more mic. I'll hand you guys this one in a moment. That one. Oh, that one over there? Okay. So to kick off the discussion, we've had several uh, discussions this morning on global coronal models, on uh, space weather, and on trying to understand the dynamo via the solar stellar connection. Uh, so it's, it's quite a bunch of different topics. We, we should probably cover them the same way we did yesterday, at least in part, in that I'd like each of you guys to identify a measurement you'd particularly like to see uh, from a polar mission to accomplish the science you talked about. Uh, how long you have to carry that out, and what the short and long-term consequences of that measurement would be. That is to say, is that an elevator? Is there an elevator measurement or is there a Buchen measurement in the first couple of days, or is there something you need to uh, to operate for months or years to get the result you want? Uh, you want to start, Carl? I, I think um, Aaron and Junwei answered the question. Yesterday, um, seismology over the pole is going to take what three months or thereabouts to do to get a signature of the deep flows and the surface mineral advection to get an idea of the dynamo. From a space space weather point of view, uh, magnetograph, and all, all the time, <laughs> and the full global sun. <laughs> Um, yeah, from, again, the space weather perspective of uh, a representative sample of CMEs, hopefully we'd have a polar view and a simultaneous approximately uh, 
uh, equatorial view, which we've never had before. I think it will point out a lot of um, questions uh, that need to be resolved uh, that, and that hopefully will lead to some better understanding of what signal we're really looking at there and what the structure is underlying it. So I agree with everything that everybody else has said, but um, I don't think we should underestimate the, the value in a first light picture um, of, especially if that first picture is right over the pole, uh, a magnetogram image would be fantastic. So I'm hearing a lot of demand for magnetogram. I'd like to open the floor too. So if people have questions, just come up to the, to the microphone and we'll, we'll put you in the rotation. Otherwise I'll try and keep these guys on the spot. I got one. I can, well, I can. Thank you. Um, how high is high enough? All right. What angle? What angle is high enough to get what you need? What let's, start, let's start with 90 and, and negotiate from there. How low is too low? 7.25. If you're asking me whether or not solar orbiter is enough, no, probably not. I'm asking something a little more specific. I'm asking you guys to go back to what you just said, to the, to the, because I think this answer to this question, there's not one answer. Um, it really depends on the science you're after. I'm very interested in knowing, um, for example, with ADAPT, uh, do, you, do you really need to have 90 degrees um, all the time? I know you just said you need it all the time. I mean, what, do you have a sense of where you're, to answer the particular science question, CMEs, the boundary and the heliosphere, uh, the polar flows, uh, the, the solar wind magnetic flux uh, question, do you have a sense of um, what latitudes are really needed? So do you mean heliographic latitude? Yes. Then 70 degrees would be um, wonderful because magnetically you're, you're bound to go for the poles with that. Yeah, I'm thinking that for what I was talking about, um, get, you know, getting a second uh, perspective uh, with a chronograph or HI kind of instrument, probably you don't need to go 90. You can probably do, you can learn things at 45. I was, I was talking with Kurt Degoning about the, the, this uh, earlier today, and he was pointing out too that you know, the thing to keep in mind is that with any kind of chronograph instrument or HI instrument, you want to kind of know as as you change the perspective, you're changing where the Thompson surface kind of lies, and that's adds a little complication to the interpretation. And I think a lot of thought needs to go into that uh, about what you expect and how you're going to analyze that. I I would agree with 70 degrees. I mean, I expect that with solar orbiter, we'll actually learn a lot um, in years out. So. Oddly enough, I'll give you the same answer. Um, but the seismologists need to weigh in at this point. I would, I would say that you need to have the entire 60 degree polar cap within a useful field of view. So that far point needs to be within 60 degrees of what is to them disk center. So 60 to 70 degrees is where you need to be to do that. Uh, Nariaki, if you could step up and use the mic here. Yeah, suppose he, uh, we can get to 70 degrees latitude, do we still need a vector magnetograph? Yes or no? I hate vector magnetographs. <laughs> <laughs> They're hard to make, hard to calibrate, have ambiguities hidden in them. If you can get multiple magnetographs flying with overlapping fields of view, you can get the vector that way. Uh, so fly, fly four of them around the sun, and you might have enough coverage. Somebody needs to study that, but then you, you, you bypass this need for the Vecner magnetography. Agree. Yeah, I want to add one thing on that. Um, we're, we're talking about like the gong instruments. I mean, those things were designed to be as identical as, as you could make them. But they aren't very identical. There have been countless corrections, and they've been discovering little glitches in, in the comparisons and stuff. And that, needs to be thought of. I mean, it's a great idea to try to or put magnetographs in orbit, but the, inter the intercalibration part is pretty big. <laughs>
Well, I'll just say I go along with the line of sight. I think that's more than adequate. Um, I think it's uh, difficult to uh, give these requirements for the questions we don't know how to ask. So I had a question. Um, I, I don't know who would be best to answer this, but if if we were able to get um, a polar mission with all the instrumentation, the cadence that we like, can you um, uh, talk about what kind of quantitatively what kind of improvements we could expect to see for our space weather forecasts? Um, well, what I would say was right now. From an Earth view, um, you can get the, the polar angle or the, the north-south angle of a CME a lot better than you can get the east-west angle. It's very hard getting the east-west angle correct, uh, and um, you, you, that that would be one of the major things you'd get. And I think the way you go about deducing where this structure lies and all needs to be rethought out. And I think there are distinct steps that you can take. You want to get this one first, then that first, and gradually pin down uh, all the data information you want about a, a CME, say. Um, following up on Vic's comment um, from the last discussion, um, intercalibration of identical instruments is challenging enough. If you think you're going to have ground-based instrumentation as your Sun-Earth line calibrated, intercalibrated with space instrumentation, you're barking up a tree you'll never get to the top of. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but, well, and I guess put all I, of them in space. Is that what you're saying? Ground-based is the need the ground-based for development or backup for operations right now because we don't have it in space. But if there, there are plans afoot, if you talk to some people, to have ground base be the Sun-Earth line and various spacecraft around the ecliptic be the spacecraft which gives you the four pi view using the Sun-Earth line from Earth, ground based. Don't think they understand the challenge. And I guess you, you kind of addressed uh, qualitatively how that might improve our, our forecasts, but can you, can you speak quantitatively? I mean, um, how, how much accuracy are we going to see? Are we going to have, um, you know, how, how much better are our predictions of how strong a particular event is going to be uh, yeah, well that, quant that, quali quantitatively? That, yeah, that example I showed you today I was talking about when we did the fit. Remember I said about that head fake thing, you know? That made it look to us like that thing, was, like the CME was nearly in the ecliptic, and that's what we fit. And it made it look like it was like 50 degrees off the Sun-Earth line. That forecast was off by 14 hours, whereas um, the NASA people didn't use SOHO at all. They ignored it, and because they had good views, with it, and, and they got it to within like two hours for that particular one. And that's not always going to happen that way, but. You know, that, that is an, certainly a, an, an example. And we have a number of outliers and things where you could look at them, and we haven't ex analyzed them yet with HI or you know, any of these other things. But, you know, I'm, I'm very suspicious of a lot of the ones that we miss badly. I, that's, that's one of the big questions. Why did we miss badly? And we're in the process now of trying to look back at, at the forecast and see what's wrong. So I think that um, the fact that you illustrate that, that um, NASA got that one right, uh, on average, everybody's going to be right if they put in enough guesses, right? Yeah. And so time of arrival for CMEs is a, is a nice, very simple metric that lots of people have studied over the last, well, certainly since 2011 when the, um, the CCMC started their scoreboard. Um, that hasn't shown any improvement since 2011 in terms of the, the, the quality of the forecasts. They've stayed about the same when you look at the, the teams that have put in um, forecasts throughout that time period. But I think that the analogy with meteorology is still good. And if you pour more data into it, whether or not you use clever assimilative techniques or you just, um, you just measure in the environment more, it will improve the forecast. Quantitatively, by how much, I, I, we don't really know. Um, we are looking at um, ideas of using the simulations, 
to to try and constrain how much more information you would need to know to be able to say um, we know that this flux rope is oriented in a particular way and then that would tell you um, what the likely fields of these Z fields are going to be when it hits one AU and obviously you would have a much better idea of when that was going to arrive. I think the time of arrival thing is probably an easier question but the actual fields that, that are going to hit um, we can only say qualitatively at the moment how much that would be an improvement. I just want to add that sometimes when you have a mistake, it isn't just like a random mistake, like you know, like like that head fake thing. But the other thing too is that in looking back at that, I decided to look at HI, which we have not been looking at, and so it's a new instrument, new observation, and it just jumps out at you that this thing is up 30 degrees, and we thought it was an ecliptic, and you know, so adding more information, but it's also rethinking how you're processing these things. Just one one comment in terms of forecasting UV and F ten point seven um, uh, emergence w would quickly become the issue. So new new emergence you, you really can't account for. So if there's any way that you can forecast or predict uh, sub subsurface um, environment, uh, that would certainly help. So hurricanes are not the only type of weather. Um, there's also the background solar weather, so the work that you're doing on predicting the rotational modulation of the EUV or the factor of two open flux that's still missing, uh, the mapping of stream-stream interactions, all of that will improve depending on what we're flying. But the more coverage of magnetic field there is, you'd hope the more improvement there is, even in quiescence. I have a follow-up um, to that, actually. And Pete, you said that just the snapshot of the polar magnetic field would be really valuable. So in terms of the magnetic flux, open magnetic flux question, would a snapshot at least rule out some possibilities, or would it completely answer the question? I'll hand it over after saying a calibrated snapshot. Calibrated. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it could um, it could certainly rule out, for example, is, are, there, are there large enough fluxes over the poles, um, especially if it was flown during solar minimum, to account for this discrepancy with the 1AU observations? That it would answer the question right there. If it was marginal, then it wouldn't. It might just add to the, the complexity. But in terms of doing the science, the, the other part of this is that you wouldn't need um, sustained observations. You really would just need uh, a traversal or multiple traversals to be able to um, to build a better picture. So um, sustained but not necessarily continuous? Right. But again, again that depends on what your um, what your goals are and, and that might also be more as a um, still in the proof of concept. So I, I will go back to um, the chief thing is to get um, sustained 4 pi steradian measurements so that we've actually got real boundary conditions for the models, which we don't have. I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, on the space weather front, uh, I'll stagger them. On the space weather front, what's more important? Well, maybe they're both important, but why and how sensitive? A coronagraph or something with more of a high kind of field of view? Um, I, I'm, I'm moving mentally more towards the high field of view, and the reason for that is because you're um, these you're looking at it farther out, and it's evolved more, and 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 there's a lot of slowing down that goes in that. Now, you, the way we deal with that now is you 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 look at the coronagraph field of view, and you get a certain velocity for your CME, which is high. You know, I mean, it'll be you know, thousand or two thousand kilometers a second in front of a fast one, and the model does that for you, it, 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 it fills in that gap and says, okay, well, it should slow down based upon the model, but that's based upon a model. This is a direct observation of the damn thing, and it doesn't get better than that. Um, I don't care how good your model is, you have to get the right background, you have to get the right inputs and everything, and, and like in that example I was showing, we had the wrong inputs, and, and sometimes it's the wrong ambient. And sometimes it's both. I've, I've seen it where they're both wrong, but in opposite directions, and you get a great prediction for all the wrong reasons. So, you know, the, 
there's nothing better than actually observing something. And, and, and the whole thing with the HI, if, it, if, you, if you can tell what the CME is doing fairly accurately at half an AU, you, you've got it 90% of the way solved. I mean, you, the error goes way down. And it'll be, go down systematically in, all, in almost all cases, I think. So if another reason just to argue with Vic, I'd, I'd go the other way because there's a, a trade-off between lead time and the prediction itself. So if you're looking at high observations, especially high two, then your lead time goes way down. And so that would probably depend on who the customer was and what they wanted. Plus you've got the boundary conditions that you've got to set up for, for the model too. And you wouldn't really have, if you had to choose between the two, you wouldn't be able to set up those boundary conditions without the chronograph observations. But I think that the best answer is both. They're equally important. Okay, so uh, jumping around a little bit, uh, I want to talk about Dynamo for a second because the Stellar Stellar connection is important to the Stellar people, at the very least. Uh, but I, I'm not a, a Dynamo guy. I don't even play one on TV anymore. Uh, but you hear people like Mark Meesh or even even you, Carl, talk about uh, the sun being in a particularly special state. It's right on the edge of having a cycle at all as compared to the population of stars. Are we likely to get to the bottom of that by tracking the flow fields that you're looking after? There is one point where we have access to try and understand it. It is the only point we have access to. It seems to me that's worth trying. Um, whether the sun is or isn't at, at an odd state, I mean, people have been trying to find a solar twin and a solar analog and a solar-like star, and depending on the definition, you may or may not find them. But among the, the narrower you define it, the fewer you will find that do what the sun does, which is very puzzling. Why, why is our star, the one that we can see best, unusual? Well, I think that combining the solar and stellar observations are essential in getting an answer to that. Um, and it makes the sun an interesting calibration point for the stellar astrophysicists. But I think the prime interest in understanding the dynamo lies here, on Earth. Fair enough. <laughs> yes. To put a finer point on it, if you had a measurement of the flow field, could you answer that question? As opposed to, is that question the most important from a space weather perspective or from an environmental perspective? The number of uh, state-of-the-art hydrodynamical convection models that get the differential rotation and the mirror flow in agreement with observations is, I think, about zero. <laughs> okay. It's worth doing. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, going back to space weather front, um, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about why we need a mission to, to better predict the shock arrival or seeming arrival time. Um, because you know maybe it can be done with uh, you know distributed observations in the equilibrium plane, not 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 needing to go out of the ecliptic. And um, my concern is that we don't really know the three D structure of CME now, and we probably need to understand that using uh, maybe um, Sabel one or you know. Still in the ecliptic, nearly ecliptic plane, but um, distributed observations along the sunless line or a little bit away, maybe 10 degrees away, to really understand the CME structure first. Otherwise, just, just observing um, single points like 0 0.5 AU or something may still produce lots of uncertainty. So, so, so I'm now feeling that maybe sub L1 missions could be better suited for observing and predicting CME arrival or shock arrival. Well, I think just from the general concept of, of triangulation, having uh, an observation out of the plane is going to give you a lot more information. So um, if you're trying to reconstruct the 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 shape of the ejector as it's traveling through the corona, okay, you, you'll be able to do more if you've got more viewpoints to reconstruct that 
and with that there's better boundary conditions to drive the 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 model the a, a CME based model um, that means that you will be able to improve the arrival time of that ejector at Earth. As Vic pointed out, it's the ambient wind that it propagates through that's a big factor too. So if you can look down from the top and you can see the CIR structure as this thing is propagating out, you can then use that either in some kind of a pseudo-assimilative way of down-selecting some of the, the MHD solutions of the ambient solar wind to pick the ones that are most like those observations. But you don't get those observations from, from high because that's all um, kind of convolved um, through the, the, the azimuthal, azimuthal projection. So I think that there's lots, of, um, there's lots of ways that it would improve space weather forecasting. But it's a difficult question to say that there's a, that there's a single you know, great way. I'll take the devil's advocate point of view. Um, but as Vic pointed out, two or three points are not tomography. The thing we see propagating, we may look, it may look like the front we're looking at, but it's some complicated structure that has, that is weighting the density distribution with scattered angles and, and all that. So I don't know that two or three points are actually going to narrow it down to where you'd like it to be. And none of it helps to get the BZ, which is the actionable input. Yeah. I was just going to add, uh, Nuriaki, that you know, we, we did this with stereo. You can't do a real 3D reconstruction from a couple of points in the ecliptic. You just can't. You have to, all you can do really is fit a model. And if your model's not right, then you can just tweak your parameters and you'll get a fit, sure. But that doesn't mean it's real. And so you really do need to get some kind of uh, uh, Break the symmetry plane. Whether it's a specific angle, I'm not going to argue. What you know, if it's 45 or 60 or 90, but to see the 3D CME structure, to have real models, then at some point in the future, maybe you can go with just an L5 if you actually understood if all CMEs followed one magic model, which I'm not saying they do. But if they did, then maybe you could actually use it that way. But but now you're just going to always have some ambiguity. I think the problem is the in-situ observations. Um, unfortunately, stereo didn't observe uh, the same CME when the separation angle was small. So you, you don't really get the uh, you know, multi-point um, in-situ observations. So, so you don't know the restruct, you know, structure uh, beyond the uh, simplified some flux drop um, for, for formulation. L When you get a CAT scan, you don't get two views. And so two views is never going to do it because you just, why CAT scans go 360, it's the same thing. It's, it's underdetermined. Yeah, so I think three views is definitely better than two. Is it transformative? I don't think we've answered that, that question. Um, but I'll take Carl's point and say, well, maybe three isn't enough. So how many can we have? Can we have seven or eight or 10 or 12? How, how, um, how small can these spacecraft be built? How cheap can they be built? And then we'd have to make an argument for why we deserve that many of them. And then what the trade-offs would be in terms of the instrumentation. As the, as the number increases, you'd obviously have to take some of the instruments off. Yeah. I was just going to add to that that for space weather applications, unlike science, understanding you want to you don't, you don't need to know a whole lot about the CME to kind of get some of the basics there. You need to know the direction it's going pretty accurately. You need to know approximately its width. You don't need to know the internal structure very well. And your chan and you know, my view is that the BZ uh, part of that is, you know, at this point, really pretty hopeless. Um, and I don't think we understand magnetic clouds very well or anything at all because that's where your main BZ, the BZ you really want to get. There's a BZ in the sheath, which you maybe you can do something with, but the BZ in the cloud you're not going to be able to do much with um, other than observe it somehow. And, and if you have a thousand cuts through, mag uh, through a thousand different magnetic clouds and you don't know where you are in any one of them, that's much less information than a bunch of cuts through a few clouds. Where you knew, where you knew your sampling. Yeah, 
enhance uh, the magnetic field strength uh, at the sea region or even behind the magnetic cloud. That's, that's often observed, right? That, that what? That's what? Uh, the to um, fast solar wind hitting the magnetic cloud from behind. So the magnetic field is enhanced. I actually want to move on to Dean, who's been waiting patiently here. Um, so so I, I would like to make a point. If you could imagine putting a spacecraft over the sun, over the pole, you could call that all the CMEs all the time. Because you would see essentially every CME, because they all come out from around you know, mid-latitude. They're rare to come out from the other pole. And so now you're doing space weather for the solar system. And if you're just thinking about doing space weather for the Earth, yeah, maybe you, you know, the polar view isn't going to help you all that much. But if you're thinking of doing space weather for the solar system, having the polar view is essentially the only one you really need to have. Thanks. And it's a nice little thing, all the CMEs all the time. See, it's <laughs> well, yeah, and if you're up high enough in that polar, polar view, you're, you're, you're basically getting a plane of sky view, which is kind of what you want, too, for many cases. And I wanted to push back a little bit on, on Vic's comment about the internal structure. I think we have different problems here. We have the problem of the boundary condition on the global model. We have the problem of the structure of the magnetic field as it leaves in the CME from the chrono. We have the problem of the evolution and the interaction with the solar wind as it goes along. And these are all problems that have to be solved. We have big open questions. Um, and the polar view is interesting because it gives you a unique insight into all of those. Um, and I do think there's a lot more progress that can be made in terms of getting the internal structure right, but it won't do us any good unless we also consider things like the evolution um, as it moves between Sun and Earth. Well, Anybody it else? looks like Sorry. we are ready to break for lunch. I think uh, so. Let's, uh, Let's thank our panelists for being in the spotlight for so long.